That's something new. Ooh, you're talking to us. That is a new I know. Wow. Oh, it's telling me that, you know, do I want to stay is the question. Yeah. Like, really? All right. <sighs> Welcome and Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvot Tal B'tzivanu L'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. I that I wanted you to be able to see. I may have to look for it again. All right. So here we are at Bahalotcha, and it's at this point in the middle of this parsha. Now, this is the parsha that has the famous two upside down nuns in the Torah. I doubt if we'll get to that point in our own reading, but it is noted for that. And uh, those upside down nuns mark a transitional point uh, because from that point on, in fact, in my humble opinion, the book of Numbers becomes a book of tragedy because we have the incident of the 12 spies, we have the rebellion of Korach, we have, um, let me think uh, what else we have that's problematic. Oh, it's in this section that Moses and Aaron are told they will never make it to the promised land. There are all these kinds of things going on. Uh, we have the story of Bilam and Balak and the incredible lack of appreciation that the Jewish people have for the, what, the protection that God gives them in preventing Bilam from cursing them. And they go and they, uh, the men go, Israelite men go and fornicate with the Moabite women. And in, the, in that process, commit idolatry. All those happy things happen in the latter part of this book. And it's such a distinction between these early parts of the book that have mitzvot and and peep and it's saying you know how the Israelites did exactly what God told them to do, etc. So, incidentally, there is an opinion that says that we have seven books in the Torah, and that's because uh, you can divide the book of Numbers into three parts. So the part that precedes the upside down nuns would be one book. And then there's those two verses in between the upside down nuns. That would be a book in itself. And then there's the rest of the book of numbers. So in other words, you can add another two books to the five that we've got already. And you wind up with wisdom has carved her seven pillars. So in a sense, there are seven books of the Torah. Just another way of making a point and, and about the nature of the Torah. At any rate, uh, we start off with this beautiful little section, as you will see, that combines in terms of the uh, interpretation, uh, as you'll see, we get into feelings. So Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Daber el Aharon, speak to Aaron, Amarta elav, and say to him, when so this this word bahalotcha has to do with alo ale to lift up to raise up, but in this case you'll, Rashi's going to discuss it. It's not an easy word to to um, translate into into English. So it's when you ha'al, when you all caused or ma'ale uh, et hanerot the lamps. And so. A simple translation would be when you kindle the lamps. But unfortunately, the word kindle doesn't really uh, have that sense of causing to raise up, something like that. El mul, and again, this whole sentence is not an easy sentence. El mul pnei hamonora. So el mul would mean opposite. Pnei hamonora, the face of the menorah. Ya irushivat hanerot. The seven lamps should uh, uh, should cause light. Should 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 uh, burn or but the point is the ore is light and they should give light uh, to opposite the face or the surface or the um, of the of the menorah. So this is just begging begging interpretation. So let's take a look. So here we go. Baha'alotcha when you cause to raise up, literally. Lama nismecha parsha ha-menorah le parshat ha-nesiyim. So 
if you are aware of what immediately preceded this particular parsha, we have that lengthy parsha that discusses the 12 gifts that the 12 princes of the 12 tribes brought to, the, to dedicate the tabernacle. And each one brought these gifts, these lovely offerings. Uh, each day they each brought identical offerings and they're all listed identically over these 12 days. So that immediately precedes this particular parsha. So he says, the fi shekishinir er Aharon Chanukat HaNesiyim, because when Aaron saw the dedication of the princes, in other words, when he saw what they were doing and how they were dedicating the tabernacle in this magnificent kind of way, Chalsha Az Da'ato, literally it means his thought became weak or his mind became weak. Literally, it means he felt inadequate, that in some way or another, he felt that he just couldn't match anything that they were doing. Keshelo haya imahem, one, because he didn't join them, the Chanukah, in this dedication, lohu, not him, the lo shivto, and not his tribe. They had nothing to do with this dedication this act of dedication. Amar lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu, said to him, the Holy One, blessed be he, Chayecha, so this is like an oath, right? By your life, Shelcha Gdola Mishalahem, the dedication offering that you're going to make is greater than theirs. Sha'ata Madlik, because you are going to have to kindle, umetiv, and you're going to have to trim et hanerot, the lamps the lights. And, and that is actually a greater act of de dedication. And one of the things, of course, that makes it an act of dedication is the distinction between a one-time act and an ongoing act. That there is a level of dedication clearly that is required when you're committed to something day in and day out, as opposed to a magnificent one-time gift. So... This, so we're being told, Rashi's telling us that this parsha, the, the placement of this parsha relative to the previous parsha is intentional to tell us this message. Uh, um, how can I say it? Below the lines, underneath it all. So now he goes into the word Baha'alotcha, when you cause to raise up. So he explains. Al Shem Shahalaav Ole, because the flame rises up. Katuv Bahadlakatan, because therefore, when they are kindled, when these lamps are kindled, when these flames are kindled, Lashon Aliyah. We the Torah uses the term, a, a term that means to go up. Why? Shitzarif Lahadlik, because he has to remain kindling in the process of kindling each lamp. Until each flame is capable, each lamp and the flame of that lamp is able to burn by itself. Because we know when you're lighting something, it has to catch. And so he's being told here in this poetic kind of way that he has to remain in the process of kindling each lamp until each flame is able to burn of itself. The Odashu Rabotenu, and our sages also interpreted Mikan from this, this expression, Shema'ale Haita Lifnehamora, that there was a little step stool or a little steps in front of the menorah, She'aleha HaKohen Omed Umetiv. And the Kohen would go up on this and stand and trim the lamps. So I wanted to get a picture of that. And let me see if I can do that. One moment, I'm gonna stop this share or maybe I can do a new share. Let's see if I can find it. So let me stop it for a second and make sure I find the picture that I'm looking for. Let's see, here we go. There we are, all right. And now I can get in here. 
show you do this there we are so there's a couple of things i want you to notice right so here we have the high priest in fact up on the steps and look at the way the flames take a special note in the way the flames are leaning i try okay if you see this one here let's see if i can make it a little larger if you look at this one here, you notice that there's a little lip. They all were like that. And so they made the wick lie along that lip so that the flame would face the central column. And that's what they mean when they say that the, that the, that the lamps should face the menorah. Because the central column, as Rashi's gonna explain all of this, represents the menorah. It's the spine of the menorah. So I'm going to stop this share and go into the other share. Oh, that's not one. Okay. Give me a moment. There we are. So let's keep going. Here we are. Uh, El mul pnehamenora. So again, analyzing this this actual difficult sentence, right? Opposite el mul, opposite pnehamenora, the face of the menorah of the lamp. El, so he explains el mul ner haemtsai. That means opposite the middle ner, the middle lamp. Sheeno bakanim, which was not in the uh, the branches. Right, you you saw how the menorah has branches. That was not it placed in the branches. Ella baguf shel menorah, but that particular lamp is in the body of the menorah. Ya iru shivat hanerot, the seven lamps should give light. So she says shisha she'al shishat hakanim, that is the six that are on the six branches of it. Shloshet uh, the three that were on the eastern side, ponim lemul haemtsai, all face uh, opposite the middle one. Haptilot shebahem, and he explains that the wicks that were in them, that is, that's what really faces them, as I showed you in the illustration in the diagram. And likewise, the three western ones, Rashe haptilot, the tops of the wicks, the mul ha'emtsai, were opposite the central one. The lama, and for what reason, why? K'day shelo yomru la'ora hu tsarich. That people shouldn't say that God needs this light. So since the wicks were, weren't facing forward, uh, that, that God is the light of the world, God doesn't need the light of the menorah. And uh, there, there, are other, there are other symbols that, that try to remind us of this. Uh, and there's probably some good stuff to think about as to what is really being said here. Uh, so for example, in the temple, the windows were made in such a way that they were narrow on the inside of the wall and wide on the outside of the wall. It's because normally when windows were made, they were narrow on the outside and wide on the inside to allow light, more light to come in and focus the light into the room. But the way the, the windows were built in the temple, the idea was that the light would come from the inside where God's presence was to the outside and that God doesn't need light. Um, as I said, you can play around with the symbolism of that. You know, some people like to think that God is a construct of our minds. Uh, this could be a symbol, similar, similar sort of saying that God doesn't need us to think of God's existence. God doesn't exist because we think God exists. God exists independently, doesn't need us to be present. And that the fact that we exist as human beings is an act for one on the part of divine love. So that's, you can see, quite a little bit of uh, analysis regarding this, this one sentence. 
Vayas came Aharon, and this is what Aaron did. Aaron did exactly this. El Mul Pnei HaMenorah, opposite the, the face of the menorah, He'ela Neroteha. He caused its lamps to light up. Ka'asher Tziva, just as Hashem, just as God had commanded at Moshe Moses. Let's, let's see if we have. There we go. Vayas came Aharon. So did Aaron do. Lahagid shivcho shel Aharon shelo shina. So this 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 little phrase is just there to tell us to speak in the praise of Aaron to praise Aaron that he didn't change one detail. He did it exactly as he was asked to do it. And a little bit more now, as since we are discussing this, and this was how the menorah was made, miksha zahav, beaten gold, ad yerecha ad pircha, from its base to its petals, miksha he, it was beaten. Kemar e asher her a Hashem et Moshe, according to uh, the picture, the, the vision which Hashem showed Moses, Kain asa et menorah, so he made the menorah. So there was, again, sort of um, certainly uh, conveying the notion of the, the divine shape that the menorah had. Uh, here we go. Vezem asya menorah. This was how the menorah was made. She'erahu ha'kadosh baruchu ba'etzba. That is to say that the Holy One, blessed be He, showed him with his finger. He pointed it out, pointed out how the menorah was made. Why? Lefi she'nit kasheba, because Moses was having difficulty visualizing how the menorah had to be made just simply on the basis of the instructions. He needed a an illustration, a picture. Lechach ne'emar zeh, and for this reason, the word zeh is used. And you notice that when we say vezot ha-Torah, when we lift up the Torah and we chant the verse vezot ha-Torah, there's a tradition of taking our pinkies and pointing to the Torah because zeh, zot, is a demonstrative pronoun showing which one, this. And there's actually, you see down here, where I have the uh, star next to the Torah Tamima, he comments on this word vizeh, how it, whenever it occurs in a sentence or in many, many times, it refers to somehow pointing something out. Uh, let's go on with it, miksha, miksha. So here's the French word, right? Mitade, um, something like that. And the Yiddish is geschlogen, meaning beaten, beaten. And, he's, and Rashi gives another example of, uh, and this is Aramaic, lashon da lada, this to this nakshan beating against each other. And I believe it's referring to some kind of uh, legs, something like that, that are smacking against each other. So he says, eshet, a block, Shel kikar zahav, of a talent of gold. They take a block of gold weighing one talent. Haita, there was. Umakish bekurnas, and he would beat with a mallet. Vechotech bechashil, and he would cut, cut it out with a chisel. So interesting that the word chashil sounds very much like chisel. Lefashet evareha, to spread out its uh, limbs, literally. Uh, so in other words, uh, the limbs of the menorah, uh, the, the branches, ketikunan, as they needed to be made, according to the pattern, the lord ne'eset evarim, and it wasn't made in pieces, al chubur, and then connected. It all had to be beaten out of one solid piece of gold. Ad yerecha, ad pircha, these are all Difficult, difficult sentences to, to really understand. So I said something to the effect of its, its base and up to its petals. 
Yerecha, he says, this word Yerecha, he hashida she'al haraglayim, or, 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 yeah. The, this was this box that was on the, um, on its legs. So I can go back and find, let me see if I can find the, the uh, picture again. Let me go there. Sorry, let's go here. Let's see if this will open up for you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna assume you can see this. All right. And okay, so you don't see it here. But they're actually, this is the box he's talking about. This does not show the little legs that it was on. Uh, I, I looked for uh, the other pictures that I had from that one book of the menorah, but I could not find it on my computer. I apologize because that would show you that this, this particular thing was on these three, at least according to Rashi, on, on, on little feet. Okay, so let me go back. That didn't work, did it? Let's see what I can do. Oh no, now I've lost it entirely. Let me see. One second, sorry. Hmm. Okay. Give me a moment and I will get this up again. One second, let's see. Ooh. I I think pre the preview, which is what I had, okay. Let's go in there. And I'm gonna go back and share. There we are. I think it quit is what happened. So at any rate, that's in other words, from its base, right? From its base. Uh, let me find the place. Yes. Uh, halul, it was hollow. Kederech menorot, just as the candles, candlesticks, kesef made out of silver, shalifne hasarim, which is in the homes of princes, that is before princes. So these very fancy, expensive uh, candles, candlesticks are made in this hollow way. And I'm sure you've seen candlesticks of silver that are exactly made this way. Ad yerecha, ad pircha, again, another time. He mentions this phrase. Klormar, that is to say, gufa, gufa shel menorah hula. In other words, he's saying that uh, the, the body of the menorah, v'chol hataluiba, in other words, in every little part of it, ad yerecha, that is shehu ever gadol. Yerecha means it's large part, the large parts of the menorah, ad pircha, until its petals, shehuma sedak, that is a, a small and thin little part of the menorah, sheba in it, hako miksha, every bit of part of it, every part of it, whether it was large and thicker or whether it was thin and small, it had to be beaten out from one piece. The derech ad, and using the term ad, in other words, it's very similar to the expression uh, in English when you say young and old came. So it doesn't just mean, you know, toddlers and aged people. It means the entire group. So this, it's a figure of speech. I cannot think of the name of this figure of speech where you use the extremities to, to describe the entire thing. But that's exactly what we're talking about here. That's how Rashi's explaining this particular figure of speech. The shamesh derech ad to you, and and you use this term ad the shamesh belashon ze in order to express things in this way. Kamo, and he gives other examples in Judges. Migadish ve'ad kama. So it would mean from uh, from the uh, the um, uh, the shocks of wheat, right? Ad kama to the standing grain. So, in other words, the stuff that was harvested and put into sheaves until the and the standing grain would be the grain that's already in the field. The ad kerem zayin and up and including 
the uh, vineyards, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Zayat would be olive and the olive trees. So what it's saying is re in referring to this all being burnt, it's saying every bit of it, every little bit of it by describing sort of the extremities. Kamar e as uh, as in the uh, illustration, the vision that God had shown Moses, Ketavnit asher herahu bahar, as it's similar to um, the uh, the pattern which God had shown him on the mountain, kemoshin emar as is stated in Shemot Kafhe, Exodus twenty five, or a vaase betavnitam or vara'a, or it could be a command. Look and and make it according to its pattern, etc. Kain asa et ha so he made the menorah, misha asa, the one who actually fabricated the menorah. Umidrash agada, and there is a midrash that says, al yedei ha kadosh baruchu neeset me'aleha. There's a midrash that says that the menorah was actually fabricated by Hashem, by God. So that's there. So I'm going to stop the share and we have a moment or two if anyone's interested in commenting on what we've read. Irvin, it's nice to see you and I want to say hi to Judith as well. So any thoughts, anyone? Uh, Shira Beth, do you want to unmute? Sorry, I forgot. That was a strange ending of the Rashi. Like mm -hmm. he's describing this incredibly um, kind of masterful craftsmanship of making this object. And then at the very end, he says, but some people say God made it. Yes. There are those who say in the, in that Moses had such difficulty being able to put this together that we could say that God actually made it. And you know, you know how I've interpreted it. I haven't read this anywhere, but I believe this is a good interpretation of the menorah that it represents the human face, that it actually represents a human face. So the outer ones are the ears, and then you've got the eyes, and then the nostrils, and the mouth. And that, and in fact, it could be a human being that the body, the, that this is all on, of course, is the human body. That, that it, it represents perhaps, you know, the spiritual person. And because these are these are the things by which we encounter the world, and uh, learn and see and experience life, perhaps uh, contribute to consciousness. Wouldn't there have, wouldn't there have to be seven? I mean, we've got two, four, five, six. Oh, you're counting two nostrils. Oh, okay, I see. I believe we have them, and they're on either side of the mouth. So those would be the inner, you know, the inner pair. Yes. Just a thought. Right. But I actually believe, of course, and I read this, I did read, um, and uh, in the Malbim, how he, he basically describes the entire tabernacle as representing the human body. And in that, in that regard, the idea that each one of us is in fact a repository of the divine spirit, that each of us, that, that the tabernacle is, is there to teach us the purpose of our lives, which is to try and bring into ourselves the divine, God's presence, that each one of us is capable of that. And with that- I remember, I remember you saying that at another study session. Right. Well, probably when we were studying the tabernacle, but thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop this and stop the recording.